All right, this is a talk that unfortunately has, or fortunately, depending on your viewpoint, has a fair amount of meat to it. I'm going to have to talk a lot about some mathematics, some physics, and some computing. But we can look at the whole talk as organized as if it were a meal into four courses. An appetizer where we look and see what's coming, a first course which you can think of as an assortment of vegetables, some of which you might like and some which you might not, then the main course, the meat of the topic, if you're not a vegetarian, and then dessert, an actual evaluation of what's going on. So let's look at some of the claims. Quantum computing is the next big thing, if it's not mobile computing. It's going to replace classical computers. It solves problems much faster than existing computers can. It can reduce the size of hardware and its complexity and there are working quantum computers. And we'll come back on the next to last slide and revisit each of these claims. So the key notions are physical, but unfortunately under the physical is a lot of math, or maybe fortunately, because I'm a mathematician as well. But we have the superposition of states. You can't for certain tell where you are. I'll talk a little bit more about these. The states of two even far away particles can be correlated in a way so that observing one freezes the state of the other. Multiple search paths can be explored concurrently, and this is the big win. But as we'll see, it won't be usable for all computing program problems. So we need an awful lot of mathematics, computer science, and physics, and I've left out a bunch of stuff. Electronics, uh, harmonic functions. I don't expect everyone to recognize all of these topics, as of maybe when I started to do this talk about a month ago, neither did I. So that's the way the world works. But uh, I was talking to Dr. Lopez about possibly doing a course in quantum computing. And when we sat down to think about what you needed to do an undergraduate course, we said, you know, you'd have to develop a special purpose major just so in senior year you could teach this course. That we maybe we should. It'd be better if we had a graduate program. So the next thing to say is, why do we think quantum computing can buy us anything? And we have to look, at least if you really want to understand, at some fundamental nature of computing itself. So following the hypotheses of Alan Turing and Alonzo Church separately, they developed a model which can be used basically as a model for all computation as far as we know. And what we can do is think of the computations. Everything can be encoded with one integer input and one integer output. You just stretch everything into one integer as long as you know that you've got deterministic input all at once. And the key idea is that you, have, you can do things very simply on an infinite tape. Control starts at this central location, the location zero, and encoded off to the right are a set of zeros and ones out to the end of the input, and beyond that, all zeros. And off to the left, all zeros. And now I have a machine that says, I start in a state that says, almost always, move right. Look at what I've got. Based on that, put myself into another state so I have a different response to 0 and 1, and follow its directions for what to write on that cell and where to go next. And it turns out with that very simple rule, so it says, OK, move right, don't do anything, move right, don't do anything, move right, don't do anything. See a 1 here, write a 0, switch so you're going to move left. OK, 
and also tells you what to do if when you move left you see a zero or a one. Okay, it may also even tell us, stay here for a few for a minute. Possible. In other words, switch to another state and let that tell you what to do. Okay. So it turns out that you can show that every other deterministic computation, you're provided with some fixed number of inputs, all of which can be encoded with integers. You want to do something and produce a fixed number of outputs of some types, all of which can be encoded as integers, can be reduced to this machine. And all other variations of this deterministic Turing machine, including getting non-deterministic in some ways, I don't want to deal with that, turn out to reduce to exactly the same thing. So I could have the integer, two integers, one over here and one over there, same thing. Okay, I could allow myself to write 0, 1, 2, and 3. Everything reduces. So let's see if we can expand a little bit on the Turing machine. Well, the next step is walk over here. After I do a bunch of steps, come over here, flip a coin. Decide whether to write a 0 or a 1. Go back one step. It says always write a one. Go back one step. Oh, zero. Now look at what the zero tells me to do and so on, but it's still a deterministic path in the sense that everything is based on that zero or one I write there, and I certainly write either a zero or a one. Okay, and it turns out that this does not give us any new complexity gains although with truly random numbers I may be able to do some things that I couldn't think of doing before in the sense of almost always getting a good answer. But it turns out that no ma uh, even with this non-determinism, any model of computation could be modeled with this non-deterministic, this probabilistic Turing machine with at most a polynomial factor increase in the number of steps. So no matter how powerful I make the machine, if I do the standard thing that you would do in programming, read an integer, or I even do something that allows me to read an entire matrix in one step, and write an entire matrix in one step, and compute a new matrix in one step, I'm going to get at most a polynomial gain. If I change programming language, if I change architecture, if I do whatever, I'm going to get a polynomial gain. You know, that's a little disappointing. It says if I have problems that take exponential time, if I have to look, for instance, at all the permutations of n numbers to see which one gives me the best arrangement according to some metric, reducing by a polynomial factor means it's still exponential. So as the program gets bigger, the size of the input gets bigger and bigger and bigger, I'm going to find out eventually I wind up not having enough time left in the entire universe, no matter how fast the computer is, to solve the problem. And the size often doesn't have to be that big at all. You know, that's disappointing. So can we do anything that could reduce the problem by an exponential factor. So we look at quantum theory and what happens here. I'm still going to the right. Some steps that tell me do nothing until you get over here. Now I look down and the square doesn't necessarily mean a zero or a one. I can see a mixed state. Some probability of reading zero, some probability of reading one. And as we'll see later, I might not even try to do that. I might try to do a different combination of results. And I can write, I can't just flip a coin and try to look at a zero or a one. I can actually write a combination of results.
And I can also do a superposition in the rule. So the rule says, look at the rule. I can observe the rule. We'll see, it's a little tricky. But in principle, in a theoretical quantum Turing machine, I can observe the rule and say, maybe I move left, maybe I move right. Hmm. <gasps> OK. So again, the key difference is the probabilistic Turing machine can write probabilistically, but it moves deterministically, and it reads deterministically. It reads what has been written. The quantum Turing machine can read a superposition of states. Sometimes it gets this value. Sometimes it gets that value. And then it can do different things, including writing a probabilistic combination of states. And that's enough to make a difference. It introduces the possibility that we might be able to solve more problems than we could with the, Turing, with the ordinary Turing machine. Almost certainly not true. It introduces the possibility of more than a polynomial reduction, and we'll see that we can find examples where that is true, at least relative to the best known algorithms. And it certainly can simulate a classical Turing machine, always write a zero, always write a one, or a probabilistic Turing machine. OK. Well, unfortunately, one of the conclusions I'm going to reach in a minute is that you can't simulate a quantum Turing machine on a quantum computer. OK? So the quantum Turing machine control was non-deterministic in reading, selecting a rule in writing. Once I know what the rule is, it tells me what to do. Looping is possible. I can walk over here, write something, walk back here, see something else, walk over here, read the same thing. I can even take this state, pick it up, carry it with me, and write over here exactly what I saw, OK? And reading it does not perturb the state that's there now. And with some exceptions, that isn't true in a quantum computer. You know, Feynman, many of you have heard of Feynman, once said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you don't. You don't. It's as simple as that. OK. So every operation in quantum mechanics has to be reversible. What that means is When I measure, as you may know, a quantum state, I force it into one of the values. We'll talk about that with the mathematics. Since it's reversible, somehow I've got to find some way I could get that original state back. So all gates have to be reversible. If you know anything about computer hardware, down the fundamentally, I mean, I don't know it as fundamentally as you do. Some of you guys know the wiring. I'll let you wire it. If it's fundamentally down there, you've got and operations or or operations, and those are not reversible. I can't recover the arguments if I know the result. I can for a not operation, right? If you're negating something makes it false, it used to be true. And I can for an XOR, an exclusive or. If I take two false, two true things, the exclusive or gives me false. If I know it was false and one of them was true, I can get the other one back. Okay, so providing for quantum gates means I have to have some extra lines so I get as much information out as I put in. And I can recover the information I put in from the information I got out. 
The technical term for the input line is ancilla lines, or ancilla. I think it's ancilla. And that's Latin for handmaiden. The technical line, uh, name for the output lines is garbage, usually. Okay. The only point with those output lines is they technically provide for quantum reversibility. Okay, so I have to take my XOR gate, and we said that was reversible in a sense, but I have to take that XOR gate and keep one line the same, because then I can recover what the other line had to be. If one of them stays true, so that's the B is the Anchilla line, the helpmate, and the A is the line that I want to negate. I can also do it with three lines, so I can take the XOR and preserve two of them. Two other, three other basic gates, or two basic gates, and one that I can think of as basic. Okay. One is a knot with two control lines. The other is two control lines that a uh, control line that negates two different things. These aren't too hard to do. And the last one is a swap. If I tell you I'm going to swap A and B, and I tell you A was five and B A is five and B is seven, then I knew before A was seven and B was five. Now for, so we've seen a little bit of basic computer background, now for some basic math background, and then for some basic physics background. A lot of linear algebra. So the first thing is, that we have to get used to the Dirac linear algebra notation which was the hardest thing for me in doing this talk. And for any finite dimensional vector space, everybody seen vectors? Okay, if I have a three-dimensional vector, x, y, and z, combination of those functions. Basically, I tell you what it does on a basis, you can tell me what it looks like. Okay. For infinite dimensional vector spaces, it doesn't work. You can find functions that don't have, that can't be broken down into a finite sum. There are some situations in which you can extend to an infinite space, but fortunately we don't have to, because one of the hypotheses for any quantum system that we can actually work with is that it's finite dimensional. So there are things we can't do with infinite dimensional spaces, and we don't have to. Yay! Okay, now a state vector in this very simple space is going to be a combination of the zero state and the one state. You can think of this as spin up and spin down, positive and negative, excited or ground, and there are a couple of others, I think I have one written down somewhere soon. But an awful lot of basic physics systems 
are spanned by these two-way decisions. So most quantum systems can be made up of just these binary decisions, which is good because that's what qubits are based on. Okay, but a state vector is a combination of the states. Here we're just doing a simple qubit, one binary choice. And ordinarily we'd think of convex combinations, so it'd be p times the zero plus one minus p times the one. But here, we're, instead of looking at convex combinations, we're looking at combinations with norm one. So the squares of the coefficients add to one. And fortunately, that gives us a little more power as well. Certainly gives us better analysis for a lot of things for the same reason that a lot of things in mathematics are squared like variance. Okay, the scalars in principle are complex, so the norm there is the complex norm. If, if alpha is a plus bi, it's a square plus b, a square root of a square plus b square, square it, it's a square plus b square. Most of the t examples we're going to use have real coefficients, but that's more an artifact of the fact that I'm too slow to do the real complex stuff, or the book is too elementary, rather than the fact that they aren't there. On the other hand, there are two import, there's another important orthonormal basis. Orthonormal means I take the dot product of two of them, I get zero if they're different, I get one if they're the same is this is basically the half and half basis. Okay, use square roots of two again because we're going to square everything. So this, these two basis vectors each have a 50% chance of being zero and a 50% chance of being one, but they're different. Okay, so how can I interpret these linear combinations? The standard linear algebra interpretation is the linear combinations you know and love from doing physics in three dimensions or doing linear algebra in three dimensions. The statistical interpretation is as a mix of random variables. And the quantum interpretation is as a mix of probabilities but the difference is, first, we have this square norm evaluation. And second, that we're not talking about a value that, in some sense, has a probability of being 0 or being 1. And it's certainly one or the other. We're talking about a value that has a probability of being 0, a probability of being 1. And that's what it is. And that's not the same thing. Which is why I should have added a philosophy class to that major we were developing. Maybe two. Okay. So how do I measure a qubit? Turns out there's a very tricky point there. You've all heard, I think, of quantum collapse. If I take a mix like this square root of 1 over square root of 2, 0, plus 1 over square root of 2, 1, and I measure to see whether it's 0 or 1, it's going to become 1 or the other, and I won't be able to recover the original state. Measurement is the thing that means I'm not reversible. Everything else has to be. If, on the other hand, I took that 1 over square root of 2, 0, plus 1 over square root of 2, 1, and I measured to see which of these two elements it was, I'd get back that it was the first one, and it 
wouldn't change it, it would still be there. So if I know the basis, I can measure, and it won't destroy the value. If I don't know the basis, I measure, and the value is gone. Am I screwing something up, Jose? <laughs> So that's going to be very important. That's the key to quantum encryption, which we'll see later. Okay. So a pure, and then we can go further. A pure state is one of these guys. It's either zero or it's one or it's one over square root of two zero plus one over square root of two one or it's one of, one of three square root of three over two. And then I can get another level of mixing, which says, well, I know it's one of these states in one of these bases, but I can't even get that far. If I'm in that situation, I'm certainly going to collapse the world. <laughs> okay. So now into some fancy linear algebra, just because it turns out we need all of this to make sense of anything bigger than one bit. And no matter how powerful my computer, if I can put in one binary bit and get out one binary bit, and the next time I do the problem, I can't retain, retain any information from the last time, I'm not going to get anything very useful. So. The next things we have to do are to do outer products, and I will get this stuff posted probably on our department's website, and I'll give it to physics, and they can post it there if they wish. And you can look over some of the technicalities here. But the outer product is going to be a way of taking a combination of functions and a combination of vectors and getting back a probability matrix of some kind. And I'm going to show it without showing you, without necessarily using things that are legitimate state vectors. In fact, they certainly don't have norm one, simply because it's a lot easier to see this stuff with simple numbers. On the other hand, I am showing complex values because it is important that we're not just talking about real numbers. So 2 times minus 1 is minus 2. That's up in the upper left corner. 2 times 1 minus i is 2 times 2 minus 2i, which is the next item in the first row, and so on. And then I take minus 1 times 1, minus 1 times minus 1, sorry, which is 1, and that's the first element in the second row, and so on. Everyone okay? And then we can look at functions that take the vector space not to numbers, but to the linear transformation with the left hand zero and the bra as opposed to the x. All things that are random. And so we can graph the bra x graph the force P I N X X P is Y X X. So we also have transformations that take the vector space to itself and they'll, or to a different vector space, and they'll be represented by matrices. And most, but not all, of those matrices for the quantum applications are actually going to be outer products. Okay. The other important class of projections, I can make this an outer product, but another thing to think of separately is a projection, and that says, Instead of just picking out the coefficient of one element, let's pick out the actual vector for that element, or a vector for some subset of elements in some basis. Okay. So 
if I looked at how outer product was defined, what I get here is this is the resulting vector, the UI, and this is the function that's applied to an arbitrary vector. And it says apply this to an arbitrary vector, it gives me the coefficient of UI, and then multiply that by UI again. So I get back the pieces that belong to each of the UIs in that sum, and I throw away the complementary pieces. A lot of stuff very quickly. And key points are, if I start out with one of those orthonormal bases, I can write all the projections in that form. And the identity is just a projection, the sum over everybody. The matrix is Hermitian. That says if I take the transpose, take the main axis and turn it over, and then take the complex conjugate of each of the elements, I get back where I started. It's idempotent. If I square it, I get back where I was. Well, that's easy to see, in fact. Take any vector. Take the pieces that correspond to this part of this basis. Now I've got something that's in terms of that part of the basis. That's all there is. Now take the piece of that that corresponds to the stuff I've already got. Big shot. Right? And every projection has an orthogonal complement. The orthogonal complement of the identity is the zero projection. Forget you ever knew anything. It's the one that works just before a test. Right? And it turns out that we can say all the measurements we're looking at are projections, possibly times some constant. When I take that projection, I can do that projection in the middle of one of these brackets and it's associative. And that's where I get the collapse. There are lots of, there's lots of other interesting linear algebra. If anybody wants to borrow the book or have me do a six hour class, I'll be happy to do it. But eigenvectors and eigenvalues more stuff on matrix types, the notion of positive definite or definite matrices, they're the ones with basically that avoid negative eigenvalues, the commutator and anti-commutator of a matrix, the commutator is the one that says, if the two matrices commute, I'm zero. The anti-commutator is the one that says, if they anti-commute, if when I multiply them in the opposite order, I get into the negative, then the anti-commutator is zero. Simultaneously diagonalizable matrices, which say they can be, they have, well, I forget, in fact. And decompositions. We have a tensor product, which is what we're going to use to build up systems with more than one bit. product says for each entry of the first matrix, you get a copy of the second matrix. In this case, we're making the convention that the copy of the first matrix, the copy of the second matrix corresponding to two is in the upper left corner. We could also have preserved the entries of the second matrix. As long as we know what we're doing, we're okay. This is the standard. And tensor products, as I say, give us a natural way to take bits and put them into other bits, put more bits into a system so it can actually do something worthwhile. And of course, we can't do just one bit at a time, so I'm going to need to put more than one bit in as input, and I'll get more than one bit back as output. And projections, again, are mostly used for measurements. There are some interesting operators. I'm going to skip a little bit more of the math. Actually, I'm going to skip a lot of it. 
but there are four interesting matrices which can be basically the matrices that behave well in terms of the standard basis 0 and 1 and the matrices that behave well in terms of that 1 over square root of 2 basis. And finally, something I don't have time to do, this would be something that would take me another half lecture. The Fourier transform. There's some references you can look at, and this is crucial to doing prime factorization. And now back to the physics. So you can relax on the math side for a while. Okay. So uncertainty, superposition, entanglement, and here's where I said it. Most of the interesting physical operators are composites of binary operators. And measurement, if I measure with respect to the basis, if I measure with respect to a basis I know about, and I know that the thing is one of those basis states, I'm good. If I measure in terms of any other basis state, the basis state collapses. Okay. What I learned in school this semester. Okay. Let's look at those. One at a time. Uncertainty says there are pairs of attributes of physical systems or of particles I can't know simultaneously. The most standard is position and momentum. If I know where I am, I don't know where I'm going. If I know where I'm going, I don't know where I am, and I felt that way quite often. And another is time and energy. If I know how much time I have left, I don't know how long I'm going to last. And it's actually an inherent problem with the values, not just the measurements. And it has to do basically with the fact that the matrices don't commute. So it's a lower bound on the commutator of the matrix, basically, of the pair of matrices, the matrix, matrix that tells me where I am and the matrix that tells me where I'm going. Okay, superposition, the first thing to say is maybe you, I, I certainly, I saw this in high school physics, standard interference pattern for a wave. Providing the slits are fairly narrow relative to the wavelength, I will get this sort of pattern. The bright yellow, the brighter spots show where the wave is self reinforcing. The wavelengths differ by an integer multiple, so I get effectively double the wavelength I would have, double the intensity. And the dark spots show where the wavelengths differ by half a wavelength, where the Distances differ by an integer plus half a wavelength, and there they cancel because the sine waves, one's negative, one's positive. Okay, so the question was at this point, back at the beginning of the 20th century, people had been fighting, physicists had been fighting about whether light was a wave or light was a particle. And in some cases, fighting should be understood literally. OK? So one of the things that happened when they thought of this and they realized that light could be broken down into little chunks of photons was, well, surely then light is a particle. If we send a photon one at a time through this slit, we should just get uniform light. So they did it. And as long as the two slits are open, you send one photon through, it interferes with itself. It goes through both slits at the same time. Maybe. If you think you understand it, you don't. Right? But 
if I, certainly if I block one of the slits, everything's fine. But if I just measure it one of the slits to see whether the photon has gone through that slit, no interference occurs. If I measure after you pass the point at which you're measuring the light, no interference. If I measure at the slit, and then sometime after I observe the light, it's what's called an erasure. I do something that makes me forget that I've done the measurement. So again, there's the slit pattern on the top. If I had only one slit open or I did the measurement, I'll just get this fairly narrow single, just simple decreasing intensity, basically exponential decreasing intensity. If I keep the double slit open, I get the bottom pattern. And I should notice that the light, lighter blobs on the two sides are fading out slowly. There are an infinite number of them, but after a while, your eyes aren't good enough. Okay. Here's one done with electrons, one at a time. And I can just literally make sure that I like, fire them with a gun. I can get them to go through one at a time predictably. And I still get this interference pattern. In fact, it's been done with something as heavy as a buckyball, 60 carbon atoms. But due to the De Broglie relation, the wavelength for a buckyball is very small. So I get things very narrow. OK. Quantum computing is real. There are quantum, sorry, quantum Uncertainty, the, uh, the superposition of states is real. There's an alternative theory that was posed called hidden variables, which is the one we've all been thinking it is, that it really has a state that we don't know about until we observe it. But if that happens and I entangle two particles, I get them so they're in related superimposed, superposed states. And then I measure one, and then I measure the other, I should have a certain set of relationships between them that simply is found not to hold upon experiment. So these things aren't in real states that simply we can't know about. They are fundamentally in this mix of states. Okay. So if I observe one and then I observe the other, the measurement of the first tells me what's going to happen with the second. With the hidden variable theory, if I had been measuring in the same basis both times, then it made sense. But if I had been measuring in different bases, then it didn't make sense, but it works. Oh, well. So we'll get to the computing in a second. Four major prep postulates. Okay, which, as I said, first, first we're in a finite dimensional situation, which is good because we can use the bracket notation. Transformation between states can be described by unitary matrices. Measurements partially collapse the wa wave function unless I know what basis I'm in and I'm measuring in that basis. And disjoint quantum systems can be combined by taking the tensor product, by making those matrices bigger, by putting a copy of the matrix first matrix multiplied at each of the second matrix. Unfortunately, life isn't even that simple. Because the numbers are complex, I can get exactly the same mix of probabilities and have different coefficients. Certainly, I can measure every coefficient by, I get, uh, sorry, change every coefficient by multiplying by, say, i which is e to the i pi over 2. Turns out I can measure, I can multiply by any such angle, I get the same probabilities. 
Turns out that doesn't matter. I can always adjust the first coefficient so it's positive real. And that takes care of what's called the global phase. But I could also just multiply the second one. And that turns out to cause some problems. Or give some benefits. You can think of it either way. So let's look at quantum computing. This won't take as long because it took a long time to get here. Okay. So if I have a mix of states and I measure relative to the standard basis, I'm going to get, so I have an, the qubit 0, 0, 1, 1. I measure the first and second bits. I get either 0, 0 or 1, 1. So I can't get 0, 1. So now I've, I have 0, 0, and I give Z the 0, first 0, and I give Corey the second 0. That's it. We measure 0, he's got it. We measure 1, he has it. Okay, so it turns out there's a way of visualizing that local shift. The North Pole and the South Pole are the pure states, zero and one. The, the basis states, I can pick A, longitudinal circle to represent the states with no shift. Well, both the probabilities are, are real numbers. First one's positive or first one's negative. And then I can shift the second argument by moving along. If you remember vaguely spherical coordinates, that's the local shift. So we have a bunch of gates. The bunch of gates first correspond to those four special matrices, the identity, which does nothing interesting, and the other four basis elements in either the standard basis or the 1 over square root of 2 basis. The identity is 0, 0, 1, 1. The other one is 0, 1, 1, 0. And then the other two are plus, plus, minus, minus, and plus, minus, minus, plus. Okay, we have a T gate, which introduces a local shift on the second entry of pi over 8. I don't know why they decided on pi over 8, except it's probably easy. And the Adamar gate, which creates a superposition, And rotation grit gates to introduce other local shifts in multiple components. There's a controlled gate corresponding to any unitary matrix. There's the swap. And if I know what basis I'm in, again, I can read that element and put it somewhere else. If I don't know what basis I'm in, trying to read an element destroys it. I always know what basis I'm in. I've lost all the advanced quantum computing. Kind of hard. Okay. So it turns out there's some immediate strange applications. I can send one bit to Alice can send one bit to Bob, and Bob can know two bits of information. Alice can send two pure bits, so say a zero and a one to Bob, and Bob can know one qubit. But both of these require a process that keeps producing new qubits, and the new cube, the new the new superposed qubits, and those get eaten up each time something is sent or something is read. Yeah. OK, so what's all this good for? Four major goals, quantum random number generator, quantum encryption, quantum computing, and quantum Turing machines. So the first one we have, all we have to do is observe a quantum process. The second one exists, and I can send small messages easily. The third one, maybe. And the last one, not on your life, though maybe in your grandson's. Okay. 
So encoding and encryption, not covering any of the details, it turns out you can do better than the standard information bound, the Shannon bound on information. I can send more information than I have. Okay. It turns out, however, error correction is harder. We know how to do best, I think, standard algorithm knows how to correct for find, one, find and correct one error or find two errors in four bits, you're sending two bits of correction. For quantum mechanics, I can recover one bit by sending eight extra bits. There's quite a bit difference in overhead, pardon the pun. Okay. Secure currency can be used for quantum, uh, can be quantum encrypted. And all I have to do is use those standard four bases, basis elements, the two bases, 0, 1, and plus, minus. The problem is if I send a long enough bit stream, Bob doesn't know what you're sending, but he does the output out send, but he does know which basis to use for each element. Or a one-time pad of some kind. principle by an infinite supply of entangled qubits. Eve, who's always the interceptor for evil, right, not a biblical reference, just a lexical one, is trying to intercept, and she has a one-half probability of guessing the wrong basis each time. So I send a long enough string, say I send a string of 20 bits, she has one chance in a million of reading the, uh, the serial number and cashing the money, but then the other point is Bob knows she's done it because the value has been destroyed. So it's almost entirely secure for transmitting, and it's entirely secure for knowing whether it's happened. Okay. Uh, quantum computing, so encryption is impossible. Quantum computing algorithms, I can get prime factorization in a power of log, so in polynomial time in the length of the number. I can get fast searching in the square root of the number of things I'm searching, but it has to be a bounded determined number, and that will do the traveling salesman problem. And here's the fast factorization algorithm. I won't go through it, but it uses some number theory and the Fourier analysis. And part of it's deterministic, part of it's quantum, and there's a non-deterministic element. I'm only 50% sure that that pass works. But in practice, I will need only a small number of such passes to succeed. A theoretical limitations, the no cloning theorem. I cannot take a superposed value that I don't know the basis of or a mixed value and read it and transfer it somewhere else and also get it back. If I think of a circuit, the flow is entirely left to right. I can't go back. I mean, you can set the wiring so it goes like this but you can't go back to a position you've been before. It can't be used, therefore, for a program with variable-sized input or output, a variable-sized stack, so variable recursion, or linked list data structures. Can't be used for loops at all unless I can unwind the loop. So if for quantum storage, I can store and retrieve a qubit if I know the basis. I can actually retrieve it, maybe, but then I destroy it if I don't know the basis. For multiple qubits, OK, so retrieval always perturbs a non-pure value, so there's no reuse of stored data. The no programming theorem. Every time I get a new algorithm, I need a new circuit, and that includes changes in size. 
So if I'm going to have something that does programming, it has to be something that puts together new circuits Okay, so implication. I think I had implications and I forgot to say this. But. Okay, first implication. Quantum computing cannot replace our standard classical computing for all problems. There are just some problems it will not be able to do. It can solve some very classically hard problems. We don't yet have that quant uh, p is polynomial time. I can do the algorithm in a polynomial number of steps. NP is non-deterministically non polynomial. I can check an answer in polynomial time. We don't know if the two of those are equal. In general, it is possible that quantum NP is equal to quantum P even if NP is not equal to P. This is one of those million dollar prize problems. You guys can figure out how to do either of these. You'll not only win a million dollars, you'll get appointed as a professor of uh, computer science or mathematics or maybe even physics without even having to do your doctorate. Okay. It's more likely that quantum NP equals quantum P I think, then that the same is true for, deter for classical computing. But we don't know. And the last conclusion is, as I said at the beginning, I can't do a quantum Turing machine with a quantum computer. Okay, so where are we? I'll try to finish up. Okay. We have an algorithm for quantum timekeeping, and people have started looking at how to do it and you can get something like a 500 times more precise timekeeper than we currently have with atomic clocks. Okay, we have a quantum architecture that can do a quantum von Neumann architecture. Again, we can't store the program, we can't store data, except in certain limited senses. But I can do some sort of general purpose circuitry but very limited size. We can figure out how to verify quantum solutions without a quantum computer. It's kind of impressive. And this is a little bit better than the previous result. This says we can get everybody on a microchip. Okay, does anybody have a quantum computer? D-Wave and several other people think they do. A lot of the ones that have been claimed to be a quantum computer are pretty certainly not. The book is still open on D-Wave, but there's probably more skepticism than support for it being a general purpose quantum computer. Okay, we can do quantum circuits for a particular problem of a particular size. I know how to do that. Trying to build something that can handle, that can be wired to do a bunch of different problems is hard. <coughs> but people have seen speed ups on particular problems. <coughs> this was in the D-Wave. There are quantum programming languages. As I said, that's sort of a misnomer. You cannot do a stored program. But I can use it for design.
And these languages currently exist in at least two families. There, is, there are variants of quantum C and quantum C++, and there are variants of functional languages. Functional languages seem attractive because functional languages already have the assumption that we're not doing assignment. We're not taking a value and changing it where it is. But on the other hand, the idea that I can clone values is kind of fundamental to the language, so it would be interesting to see how they got around it. Some people have said, some sources have said, well, DNA computing is kind of similar, isn't it? And of course, uh, nobody short of a few nuts is going around thinking that genetic information is stored in superposition or amino acids or bases or anything. But it's highly parallel. It does sub-problems in somewhat the same way. You don't know what you're doing, and the answer magically appears at the end. It can swap pieces of existing pieces. This is, this is standard genetic stuff inside the chromosomal material. You get pairs of chromosomes, and they sometimes swap segments. On the other hand, you also have, it's called crossover, you also have insertions, deletions, transpositions. I guess you could do a transposition quantum computing. But insertions and deletions, you can't. That changes the length. And I need to have some sort of fitness state to encourage the DNA to reproduce toward the solution. So if I don't have some way of encoding a fitness function, I can't do anything. So the set of programs this can handle is different. It has, in some ways, the same flavor, but they can't be equivalent. OK, so back to the four problems I started with. Quantum computing is the next big thing, not in the short term that mobile is, but in the medium to long term. And the answer is, basically, that's not a statement of fact. But it's quite probably true insofar as it is. It will replace quantum computers. No, it can't. Okay, it will be, it can do some things much faster. Yes, can do everything much faster. No, can do everything much faster than it can do. Probably not. It reduce hardware size and complexity, almost certainly false. We just saw that checking one quantum bit is wrong takes eight bits <laughs> in the circuit, and not just two bits to check four. And there are working quantum computers. It depends on what you mean and who you believe. And finally, some interesting other books. The first one is a Quantum Mechanics for Dummies, almost. Recent publication. Basic books. I don't know what happened to that one either. This year. And the other two are references that uh, Dr. Troja was kind enough to give me on some somewhat earlier work on quantum architectures. And Thank you very much.